Timber Talks is brought to you by Wood Solutions. Stay up to date with the latest in timber, the building material that is strong, safe and sustainable. Here is your host, Adam Jones. Upfront carbon is increasingly in the spotlight as operational efficiency increases. So environmental product declarations, EPDs, these are vital in measuring the impacts of the materials we use to arrive at the best design outcomes. Today we're speaking with Stephen Mitchell, who's the Principal Consultant at ThinkStep ANZ and Chair of EPD Australasia. In this episode, we discuss the exciting developments in materials on the road to carbon neutrality, the life cycle of a timber product, and the opportunities that designers and the supply chain have for improved sustainability in design. I hope you enjoy listening to this as much as I did speaking to Steve. And without any further ado, we'll get into the first podcast of season three of Timber Talks. I mean, up until recently, carbon emissions from heating, cooling and running buildings, they're called operational emissions. They've been under the spotlight for for 10, 15 years. But... um, and that's mainly because a lot of data was showing operational emissions from heating and cooling a building are, are pretty high and they're quite easy to address. So, But as buildings are becoming more energy efficient, you know, a lot of work being done on insulation, on LED lighting and uh, efficient air conditioning and heating, those emissions are coming down. And it's all hands on deck when it comes to emissions. So embodied emissions is the new frontier um, and there's a lot of data to show that those as buildings become more energy efficient and operational emissions come down, the proportion from the um, of emissions from building materials or the upfront or embodied carbon emissions, they get higher as a proportion of a building's uh, carbon footprint. Hmm. So, um, and the World Green Building Council, they released a report a few months ago on upfront carbon emissions and the Green Building Council of Australia, their signal they're going to require green star rated buildings to reduce their upfront carbon emissions. So it's a bit of a hot topic at the moment and uh, I think it needs to be. And in all of this, I guess measuring is going to be one of the most important things going forward. So Steve, can you tell us a little bit about what environmental product declarations are, better known as EPDs? Yeah, well, um, EPDs, it's another acronym um, or environmental product declarations. Um, They provide independently verified data about the environmental impact embodied in a product across its life cycle. So um, that data includes the product's embodied carbon footprint. Um, So in a whole building context, um, if the product's intending to be used to have EPDs um, and they meet that same standard, you can use the data, the quantifiable data in those EPDs to evaluate a product's relative contribution to your building or fit out project's total embodied carbon footprint. So much like a um, strength properties or stress stress properties of structural pieces of timber or um, data about durability, data about fire resistance, environmental or carbon footprint should be no different. You know, you can use those numbers provided in an EPD to quantifiably uh, come up with a a carbon footprint of your building or project. So that's where infrastructure people, people doing railways, people doing railway stations, train lines, um, you know, services, as well as um, whole buildings from housing, hospitals, they can take all that data from an EPD and they can suck it in uh, using, using appropriate software and make those comparisons in a design sense to reduce the carbon impact of their building. Being a podcast on timber, we're inevitably going to look at the EPDs of a range of timber products. But before we go there, uh, I'd love for you to just touch on some of the other environmental developments that are happening with other structural products currently. Yeah, well, uh, my company thinks that we do all sorts of building materials. Obviously, we worked on timber and we'll talk a bit more about that in a sec, but we also do EPDs uh, for steel, cement, Aluminium fit out products, wool. We've done a railway carriage, <laughs> but um, the yeah. But there's real some really exciting developments in other materials. You know, everyone's on on board with this carbon footprint message, and some of these other sectors are really uh, making some good gains in this space. Um, 
So the world uses a lot of steel, a lot of cement and aluminium. Um, it's estimated that uh, they emit about 15% of the world's carbon emissions from producing those materials. So they have a huge impact. But steel, they're trying to reduce their carbon footprint, um, making new steel from iron ore with hydrogen instead of coking coal. So Swedish and German companies are using a renewably sourced hydrogen instead of coal to provide the heat for that process. Um, CSIRO have got a whole uh, research and development project on using coal sourced from renewably sourced wood to, in place of coking coal. Mm. So that would, if that's, if and when they're successful, they'd, that would reduce the carbon footprint of steel enormously. But um, also making new steel from recovered scrap with electricity sourced from renewable energy. So there are plants opening up in the states now where the, the sole source of electricity from melting the scrap is from you know, solar and wind uh, and battery combinations. And uh, Mr Gupta in South Australia, that's his stated plan for, you know, um, the steel that uh, he'll be making in, in South Australia as well. The, the cement industry, um, they've got a huge technical challenge in making Portland cement, which inherently the process of making that emits a lot of carbon dioxide, but also other gases. Um, that other gases makes it a bit hard to separate the CO2 from the process, but there's an Australian company, Calix, it's, um, they're trialling a CO2 separation technology in a European Union project, which looks very promising, separating the CO2 from the other gases. What you do with the CO2 after it's isolated, it'll have to be buried and sequestered somehow, but that's a, a step that they're betting on will, will, will take place. Um, and then the other big story in cement and concrete is the use of alternative cementitious materials such as coal ash uh, and slag. Um, that's a residue from steel manufacturing. You know, displacing the use of Portland cement in concrete products with these other uh, cementitious materials, um, that can really result in a lower carbon emissions for concrete. Um, you know, the EPDs we see on the Australasian EPD program website for concrete and cement products that it makes a huge difference using those alternative cementitious materials uh, over Portland cement to your uh, building's carbon footprint. Mm. So let's look at the life cycle of a timber product. It begins with the forestry side of things. So can you start by telling us what happens here from a CO2 point of view at the very start of the life cycle? Yeah, so... Um Oh, so there's a great cartoon out there, which I'll send you a link to, but um, it illustrates that uh, trees grow from the air, which is just a really mind-bending thing. But uh, there's plenty of science behind that. So those trees in the forest or in the plantation, they're taking the CO2 in the air and they're combining that with water um, to and photosynthesis, obviously energy from the sun, so they absorb the carbon dioxide, they convert it into carbon and they emit that oxygen, which goes back into the air. Um, and so they're storing that carbon they've taken from the CO2 in, in the wood itself um, and they're growing, you know, over 30, 40, 50 years. Um, softwood grows slower than um, hardwood or native forest uh, timber. So a forest or plantation, they're, they're, they're big carbon stores and um, Australia's got a pretty good handle on how much carbon is stored in these forests and plantations. Uh, there's been a lot of research being done on that. You know, the bushfires, recent bushfires, uh, you know, there was a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of science behind how much carbon was emitted from the forests that were burning, which is unfortunate, mm. um, very unfortunate. But um, there is as much carbon stored in Australian timber plantations as, as is stored in Australian housing, mm. if uh, you can get your head around that. So yeah. that carbon that's stored in the wood in a tree, we've got the equivalent, or if not more, of a whole, whole of Australia's plantation estate stored in Australian housing and building in the mm. wood uh, that's, that's in, the, in, in these buildings. Um, the amount of carbon stored in Australian native forests, uh, only a small part of that is timber production area, you know, but it's, uh, you know, 100,000-fold sort of uh, 
uh, the amount of carbon that's stored in Australia's native uh, forest, but only a small amount of that is used in timber production. And obviously that goes into a house or a building and that's stored for a, a very long period of time. And mo for most of its life, it's very safe and protected from fires. So it's mm. in a very safe place. Tell us, Steve, a little bit about certification and the importance of it being certified and what this actually means, and then also some of the risks if you don't have a certified product. Well, the word sustainability is actually an English translation of a German word, which I cannot pronounce, but it's uh, – and sustainable forestry uh, actually started in, strictly speaking, in, in Germany in the 1600s. There was a – regional inspector of mines there. He was also responsible for forestry and he was responsible for, the, for his province's uh, silver mines, which used a lot of timber. And he wanted to make sure that um, he drew up some principles of sustainable forest management so he could ensure there was always going to be enough timber to supply a silver mine. Hmm. Um, but sustainable certification itself didn't start in a broader sense until, say, the Earth Summit in Rio. I'm old enough to remember that back in 1992. <laughs> um, it might be before your time, Adam, but I'm not sure. I was, I, was, I was two years old, Steve. <laughs> two years old. Okay. I'm sure you were hanging by the TV at that stage, uh, right. watching Sesame Street, <laughs> switching over to the Earth Summit. <laughs> um, well, that, that Earth Summit back in 1992, there was a big push to protect, um, to stop deforestation. I think, you know, there was a huge push to stop deforestation, but governments around the world said, no, nah, we're not doing anything. It's all, it's all, all keep away from our, our land. It's got nothing to do with you. So a group of people got together and they started a voluntary market based approach to, to improve forestry practices worldwide and that's from that developed the Forest Stewardship Council or FSC and just shortly after that a, a European scheme so called Pan-European Forest Certification Scheme started that or PEFC uh, that's that's become now. Um, so those voluntary market-based approaches started up to certify the forests were managed um, sustainably and the forest and civil cultural practices were best practice. And they took into consideration not just environmental issues, but social issues, Indigenous people's rights um, as well. So that's the forest certification. And then the other part of certification that developed was a chain of custody. You know, how do you know that the wood you're buying is from a certified sustainably managed forest? And that's where chain of custody certification uh, came about, you know, it, it's certifying each part of the supply chain, like the uh, the forest, the uh, sawmill, the wholesaler, the final product manufacturer. You know, they have to be certified to those standards, to say, and they pass on the claim from the forest all the way to the end consumer. So mm. I'm I'm an FSC and PFC chain of custody auditor, so I go into these businesses and check that their management systems and they're passing on a, a valid claim. Uh, most Australian uh, sourced softwood and native hardwood timber available on the market today is sourced from forest certified to FSC or the local PFC scheme called uh, Responsible Wood. Mm -hmm. Most Australian producers and many importers um, are also chain of custody certified, so they can supply your certified product on request. When the trees grow in the forest or plantation, the CO2 is absorbed and, and carbon stored, like we were saying. Hmm. But after, um, when they mature, say 30 years in the case of Australian softwood plantations, the wood's harvested, a lot of that goes into long-lived sawn timber products. Uh, some of it gets emitted because it gets burnt or, or used in short-term products. Um, but after the harvest, the plantation is replanted. The next rotation of trees stores more carbon. So this can go on indefinitely. So if you've got a sustainably managed forest, hmm. um, you can indefinitely storing bits of carbon. Sure, some gets re released when it gets harvested, but it grows again. And you're storing that carbon in housing and buildings. Um, and the forest, back of the forest, that rotation uh, can go on indefinitely. 
And um, yeah, it's a, I'll listen if you if you wanted to invent a carbon sequestration machine, <laughs> um, this is exactly what you'd do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it grows from the air. Just add water. <laughs> it's just mind bending. So we've spoken a little bit about the forestry side. Moving now into the product phase, what happens here in the manufacturing of a timber product and where do most of the greenhouse gas emissions come from? Well, um, when we developed the environmental product declarations, we looked at the whole life cycle from the forestry to the production phase. Um, so those EPDs for sawn timber, sawn softwood, sawn hardwood, I mean, they've got a, a very similar sort of life cycle. Um, in the production of timber, most of the emissions, carbon emissions come from the kiln drying process. So your log comes in, uh, it gets broken down, uh, it gets sawn into green timber and then loaded into a kiln pretty, pretty quickly if it's a softwood. If it's a hardwood, it might go out through a bit of air drying before it goes into a, a kiln for drying. And then um, it gets um, dressed and then packaged for, for, for sale. So um, the most of the carbon emissions come from that kiln drying process. Where that's what ThinkStep found. Um, that was the big uh, sort of um, relatively big uh, mm. side emissions for, come from the kiln drying in the production side. Soaring the timber, and so probably not surprisingly, if you know anything about how factories run, but it's associated dust extraction and the electricity consumption there that can produce, uh, that uses a fair bit of electricity and emissions associated with that, and that's obviously used to protect workers' health and safety. But um, about 70% of the thermal energy needed to dry Australian softwood, for example, comes from burning the sawdust. You know, so it's efficient use of that resource. You've got a, a handy fuel on hand, and so 70% of our thermal engine, engine needs are from burning that sawdust, and they use a bit of natural gas to, if uh, if they're close to a source of uh, natural gas. Hmm. So soaring and dust dust extraction, they use a lot of electricity, and Australia's got such a dirty energy mix that that can be a significant uh, emission from that process. Do you think there's an opportunity now for the supply chain to improve the environmental performance in the product phase so it's an even better environmental product? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, following our study, the ThinkSep study, um, um, that definitely helps focus people's attention to the people who contributed data on where their hotspots are, and that's a good thing about EPDs. Um, you've got to do a life cycle assessment of the process and you come up with a hotspot. You know, where are the bigger energy users in the in your process? And manufacturers can use that information to improve their process. So a lot of software manufacturers at the moment, they're investing a fair bit of money in better kiln technology, so more efficient drying processes, um, high rotation sort of processes just to minimise transport, you know, moving stuff in with for, in and out with forklifts. It's very energy intensive. So that's really um, where a lot of gains can be made. Um, people are putting on uh, solar panels on their roofs, um, using battery technology to um, so that they're, they're using more renewable energy uh, in, the, in the sawmills. Uh, Nataras, uh, if you go up that way in the far north coast of New South Wales, you'll see Nataras Simba. Um, well, I don't know if the bypass it goes past that. Now, but if you go into town, you'll see the big solar panels all over his roof. Um, yeah, so people are becoming more sophisticated about, re you know, uh, reducing their energy needs and also making sure that their energy needs are met by renewable energy. So when you actually measure the carbon footprint, so you, you've got the forestry stage, your one cubic metre of, say, sawn software will store about 900 kilos of carbon dioxide. Forestry processing, kiln drying and dressing, they consume about 200 kilos. So if you add those two together, you get uh, negative 700 kilograms of carbon dioxide, you know, when, when the timber's leaving, leaving the um, sawmill gate. So you've got no other building product can really boast that better than carbon neutral uh, yeah. footprint. So having those numbers around there and having them independently verified gives people a lot of, well, not only helps the manufacturer understand where their hotspots are, but it helps the end user understand uh, what they've got. And the EPDs we're talking about, 
can be found on the Wood Solutions website. So there has been a lot of work into industry-wide EPDs, so a standard understanding of what the environmental impacts are. And looking at one meters cubed of kiln-dried softwood, for example, like you were saying, there's minus 900 kilograms of CO2 sequestered per meters cubed in the forestry stage. And then there is a number for haulage, processing, kiln drying being the highest at 87.3 kilograms, um, then planing and packaging. And then finally, when we get to this point, there's four different choices or four different routes we can go down in terms of environmental impacts, and that is at the end-of-life phase. Can you tell us a little bit about what happens at the end-of-life phase and how designers might best uh, approach this part of the the life cycle? Yeah, those EPDs do include uh, a few different options, and that's an area of timber use that uh, are all at end-of-life. That's an area of timber life cycle that I think there's been a bit of misinformation about um, and new information. You know, there's some new peer-reviewed research which we refer to in those EPDs. Um, so when it comes to end of life, you've got reuse, recycling, renewable energy or burial in a well-managed landfill. They're your options for your timber. And often end of life options are, are very locally based, which is why we've included each scenario. Um, it can, because timber hasn't used much energy to make, doesn't it means that end of life timber is not is not generally internationally traded. It's 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 you've got to have a local solution because, uh, so in terms of reuse or using salvage or recycled timber, you're prolonging the amount of time that the carbon stored in it is out above ground uh, and not back in the air. So think longer term usage, the better. Um, Chipping, another option is chipping and recycling lower quality salvage timber. That can be a good option, particularly if it can be recycled into new particle board products. And um, I'm using, I'm helping uh, Borg Polytech with doing that, just that in Oberon in New South Wales. And Dino Henderson, who make particle board product in Victoria, they're doing, they've been doing that for a few years, but Polytech are, are just starting out on that. Um, you can use very low quality recovered wood for thermal energy and, and electricity generation. So you can burn it in place of fossil fuels. Uh, and Laminex uh, up in Queensland, they've just received a half a million dollar grant to investigate the feasibility of that. And um, so if you're not using coal or gas, you're not putting fossil fuel emissions into the air. But even burial in a well-managed landfill can have substantial benefits. That peer-reviewed research I referred to Uh, earlier that's found that the carbon in um, Australian wood and many other woods can just sit there in a well-managed landfill for a long over a very long period of time Mm. so that's why when we did when ThinkStep did the EPDs we included all those options um, not just for Australian wood products but for New Zealand wood products and manufacturers association so I'm focused, talked a lot about Australian timber products, but mm. some of this can apply equally to uh, some of our imported products. So what about the designers? What can they do to minimise the impacts in their design? Oh, this, there's heaps designers can do, right, um, to minimise their impacts. There's design and structural optimization techniques. Um, like I was saying at the beginning, I think you asked me where, where are the impacts um, we'll pay particular attention to the floor and flooring structure and what you, what sort of materials you're using there and uh, design for uh, structural optimization. Um, that floor and floor structure, that can be a really carbon intensive area and that's where big savings can be made. Um, using and designing prefabrication, um, that can save a lot of waste, can save a lot of time on site um, and you can really ramp up using um, – low embodied materials in, in that sort of situation. Um, but one thing is um, uh, is knowing and measuring your building impact. I mean, we work, ThinkStep work with uh, Lend-Lease and other developers to do just that. So we help them in a pre-designed stage, understand where the impacts are uh, and use the software to minimise the embodied compact, uh, the embodied uh footprint of, of, of a building um, and that's one of the reasons Land Lease is such a big supporter of timber and wood products by the way because they've, they've, they've done the numbers they've used the EPDs to 
uh, run the numbers for their structures. Um, sourcing sustainably harvested wood. We talked about FSC, PFC, responsible wood. Um, not all wood is good wood, you know, uh, wood from land cleared to make agricultural forests, uh, make agricultural land. Not all wood is good, so that's where the certifications of the source material can really help give comfort to you that you're, you're doing the right thing, sourcing it from the right place. Um, and one really important thing is ask for an EPD, you know, um, by asking for an EPD and using that for products uh, that you're supplied or potentially being supplied with, you're really driving that process of life cycle assessment uh, of, for a, a manufacturer and a supplier. So they have to look at their supply chain and how they can minimise their impact. An EPD is just a summary of the impact of their material. And But what really drives that improvement stage at the supplier's end is, is often they, they actually don't realise themselves uh, what the impact is of their product at different stage, and they don't they don't measure it necessarily, but an LCA and an EPD makes them measure where it is. Um, so, uh, as a designer and a specifier, a, a one thing that people can do is ask for an EPD. Might be a little thing; it's not going to cost you anything itself, but that can be a big signal to the market to drive improvements and induce uh, induce change in the in the carbon footprint of building materials. So. You can look for those EPDs on the EPD Australasia website or the thinkepd.com website that ThinkStep have just set up or get in touch with me if you want to know more, more detail. An environmental product declaration, EPD, is a standardised and verified way of quantifying the environmental impacts of a product based on a consistent set of rules that have been developed through an extensive stakeholder consultation process. So Wood Solutions have conducted industry-wide EPDs and you'll be able to find these on the website at woodsolutions.com.au forward slash articles forward slash environmental product declarations.